for 10 weeks, I think, I guess, yeah, about 10 weeks since we did the beam time. So we've done some analysis, and when I say we, I'm using the royal we, I must admit I've not been heavily involved with the analysis. It's been driven by a guy called Sam Jarvis, who was switching to lectureship in Lancaster, so he's been driving it. Sam has actually got a talk next week at a conference in Manchester on the work we did at Diamond. Yeah, it was a good session. For a beam time session, it was a good session. And in, interestingly, compared to most beam time sessions, what happens is that it goes pear-shaped for the first five days, or the first, you know, 70 or 80%, and then you finally get it going in the end and you're all hands to the pump and you're really working hard. This, uh, this way was the other way around. We got an awful lot of data in the first three, three or four days and then we were trying to prepare a sample at the end and it just didn't work and it didn't work, but we got enough data in those first three or four days to um, really make it a big success. So we got, we got, we got enough data, there's 70 odd pages of, this is just, yeah, the raw data plotted out, yeah, all the different graphs we got, all the different spectra where we're putting photons in, looking at electrons coming out and collecting those electrons. So um, yeah, it was, it was successful. Great thing about a beam time run or a run like this is that uh, it can, if when it goes well, you can get a ton of data out of it. You know, enough data that because it's 24 hours, um, you know, five or seven days or whatever number of beam time days you've got, and everybody's really, really focused, it's, it can be incredibly productive. The problem is, however, it can also be incredibly not productive. All it takes is for one little thing not to go right and then you spend a lot of time chasing your tail. And you know at the time, it's not like you've got to come weeks later and look through it and think, oh, it was a success, like you know at the time uh, this, is, this is gold. That's a good point. No, I wouldn't quite say you know it's gold. You can do the analysis and you should be doing the analysis as you're going along. But sometimes, particularly if it gets fraught towards the end, you're trying to get an awful lot of data in and you can plan it out as much as possible, but sometimes you'll come back and you go, oh, if only we'd got this measurement, particularly as you're going through the analysis and you find something, and I don't know, say you're doing a number of different temperatures and you just stop at this temperature, and it looks like it's either continuing or tailing off or peaking or whatever, and you really need that extra data point, then that's the massive pain in the behind, because what you'll have to do then is apply for more beam time, and it might be six months or 12 months or 18 months, and that's, that's one of the irritations with beam time. Have you had any of these this time? Uh, no, actually it looks like it's, um, there are a couple of things we still obviously don't understand, but overall, the molecules arrange themselves on the surface as we'd like. We got extremely nice electron diffraction patterns, very well ordered, and the, the, the water molecule inside the cage from the measurements we did also looks well ordered, so we can get a position for that water molecule, find out um, how far it is above the, the, the surface. So yeah, it, wor it worked well. The one thing that didn't work is what we wanted to do was dope it with potassium, so to put potassium down, add some electrons to the cage and see if we could shake up the water inside. Uh, that um, failed catastrophically <laughs> in the last couple of days. Uh, what We put the potassium down and it just churned the surface up. We lost the electron diffraction pattern, just became a mush. Um, but that was okay, before that we'd got enough data. What we wanted to do was to take a fullerene molecule, which is a C60 cage, which has got a water molecule inside, put it down on a surface, and what we wanted to do was form an ordered film, an ordered monolayer, a single film, and see when we put it down on the surface, is the position of that water molecule affected um, due to bonding with the surface. So we did that, we achieved that. That's a pretty nice result because what we can do is we can triangulate that position of a molecule within a molecule um, and find out just how, if you encapsulate different species inside a carbon cage, to what extent are they protected from their environment. And that's important for a wide range of different, um, you know, sort of future uh, studies and future applications. So are you saying, is the C60 acting as like a Faraday cage around a water molecule? Yeah, that's effectively it. It's acting like a, a very strong shield around the water molecule to the, to the extent where it looks like the water is completely oblivious to what's happening outside. And what was the answer? And the answer does seem to be that the water is completely <laughs> oblivious to what's happening outside. Um, we, need to, that we're, we need to churn the, the data a little bit more, look into it in a little bit more detail, but we're certainly getting, even sort of eyeballing it at this stage, you can tell there's what we call a great deal of coherence in the signal, which means there's a great deal of ordering in the, in the water positions.
Phil, does the water molecule still fall to the bottom of the sphere because of gravity? <laughs> what a great, that's a great question. No, not at all. On our scale, gravity plays absolutely no role at all. If you work out, so everything for us, the only force we really care about is the electromagnetic force and the force due to interacting electrons. That's really all we care about. If you work out the force between, this is a great number, if you work out the force between two electrons, if you work at the gravitational force and compare it to the electrostatic force, 42 orders of magnitude difference in the force. That is great that 42 is riven into the fabric of nature like that. So, Phil, if I, if I could look at this, which I know is quite difficult with normal eyes, would the water molecule sit perfectly in the middle of the sphere? Does it bounce around and have a jiggly? It up? has, yeah. It will always jiggle. Quantum mechanics tells us it will always jiggle. That level of jiggle is relatively small. There's some very interesting quantum mechanics associated with the fact that um, it's confined within the cage. Our experiment doesn't really count is at too high an energy scale to see all that quantum mechanics. We've got colleagues in the in the department who do that. But in terms of visualizing that, it's it's pretty close to the center of the cage, yes. You know, as you know, and from discussions we've had before, I'm a huge fan of fundamental science and curiosity for curiosity's sake, etc., etc., etc. But you know, we 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 shouldn't just do this um, massive, you know, split between this is the applied engineering side and this is the, the the pure science side. It's a feedback loop, and the application drives the science, and the science drives the application. The best example of that is. Um, thermodynamics. So scientists are always very keen to say, well, first of all, we put the basic science in place, we get the fundamentals down, and then the applications stem from that. And that's a great thing to say when you're writing a grant application, but it generally doesn't work like that. We, need, we had steam engines before we really understood under the thermodynamics. But in this case, you know, I'm always hesitant to say this is going to lead to a wonderful new technology, particularly if you're working at, you know, four or five Kelvin in an ultra high vacuum. But it, the fact that you can take these um, molecules and isolate them inside the cage and isolate them entirely from their environment. The question then is, how do you actually influence them? Can you put electric fields on? What size of an electric field would you need to put in? If you put a probe on top, if you even, you know, if you pass a current through, how does that affect the water? A whole range of different questions. But yes, it's... Um, you know, we're running out of steam with silicon. We need to think about different aspects of molecular electronics. And um, certainly this is one way to go. What, how does this end now? What happens now with the data? How long until we start seeing papers and Nobel Prizes oh. and everything? <laughs> Nobel Prize isn't on the cards. But in terms of uh, papers, certainly we'd hope to get something out by summer. So um, we've got this, the, the good thing about presenting at a conference is it gives you a little bit of impetus to actually, because you have to stand up in front of other people and explain your results, it gives you a bit of impetus to think about what's actually going on and get it, get it down. So we, we'd certainly hope to have something submitted by um, summertime, by June. Who's going to do that? I see, a, I see a pile of data on your desk. Who's got the job of writing a paper and how's this happened now? So this will be a sort of joint thing. So the data analysis at the moment, uh, Sam Jarvis is doing a lot of that. Rob Jones over in chemistry is also been heavily involved. It's Rob's code for one thing. He really put an awful lot of the pioneering effort into the technique we're using extra standing wave analysis. So um, Rob and Sam at the moment are driving it. In terms of a draft of a paper, there's already, because this is a sort of second round of these experiments, there's already three quarters of a draft of a paper written. Um, I'm very happy to sort of try and bring all this stuff together and, and, and produce the first draft of the paper. And once we get to the end of the academic year, I'll have a little bit of time to do that. How truly big it is. I mean, it's, it's vast. You know, and it's kind of, I think it's crazy to think that, you know, it's so big and yet we're looking at something so small. I and mean, it's, it's, it's the sort of paradox of the whole thing.